Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of What's Your Story? I am Catherine Mwangi. We're here at Spring Valley Coffee in Lovington. This is their latest brunch. You, of course, you've noticed that our location tonight is very different, but that's because we want to feature the story behind Spring Valley Coffee. So I'll always have a backstory for you. I think today maybe there are three of them, but I won't bore you with all of them because one of them I'll have to have to share that with my guests. He's the owner, or rather the founder, CEO of Spring Valley Coffee, Ritesh Doshi. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you because, again, I like to tell them how I meet the guests on this show. So I was having one of those days on LinkedIn and just, you know, posting whatever it is I do there. And as I'm about to just sign out, uh, your profile shows up on my feed. All along, I have always known this is an international brand. So when I came onto your feed and I see what, Kenya, Nairobi, oh, let me write to him and see where this goes. And what's this? I think a month later, here we are. Yeah. So this is a Kenyan brand. It is indeed. We've been around, it'll be, our, it'll be 15 years since we started uh, this year. Yeah. Um, but it is 100% Kenyan brand. Yeah. So let me tell you how I knew about Spring Valley Coffee. So the LinkedIn part was just this year. But last year I was traveling to, to, to South Korea. And a friend of mine who's based there said to me, so I said to her, what do you want me to bring for you? And she said, oh, I just, I don't want anything. Just get me Spring Valley coffee. I said, oh, okay. Uh, where do I get that? <laughs> so she said, she told me where to go find it. And I said, okay, uh, just send me the picture. So she sends like five different varieties. And I said, okay. So I said, mm, if, the, if it's this important, let me just times three times three times three. That's my first interaction with Spring Valley coffee. Then I said, let me get me a pack and see what this is about. Because someone in South Korea wanted this coffee. How they came across it, I have no idea. But what, what do you think makes your coffee unique? Um, it's quite, quite simply, yeah. we keep the best stuff in the country. I'm, oh. I'm selfish, yeah. and I want a great cup of coffee. And for a long time, the best of Kenyan coffee has always been exported. And as a Kenyan, why did I have to drink the best Kenyan coffee mm. when I was traveling, when I was abroad? Right. And there's, there's little, known, little known nuggets. I live in Spring Valley. I've lived there for, for okay. the last kind of eight or nine years. Yeah. And this was my local coffee shop. And I pop in every day and have a coffee and buy a bag. And I absolutely love the coffee. And I asked the previous owners why I like the coffee so much. Mm -hmm. And they said, it's simple. We keep the best stuff here because we enjoy drinking it. And I felt exactly the same. I was born in the US, but my mom's family is Kenyan. Okay. My dad's family was in Ethiopia. Um, but I moved back to Nairobi when I was in my teens. I went to high school up in Langata at Brookhouse, went to university in the UK, spent most of my life working in finance in London, New York, the Middle East, and I moved back in 2012. So I was, what you say, an entrepreneur stuck in a, a I was an entrepreneur stuck in a financier's body. Okay. Um, and I moved back in 2012 to start a company called Naked Pizza, Yeah. which was a healthier, but frankly, a better tasting, pizza delivery business, and that was in 2012. Mm -hmm. And I sold that business in 2016 to Pizza Hut. And after that, I, w I took some time out to think about what I really wanted to do. And I wanted to showcase the best of what we had to offer in Kenya and take it to the world. But I spent a lot of my time thinking about that at what was then called Spring Valley Artisan Coffee. And I'd sit there, and I went there for two reasons. One is they're the best coffee in town, and I fundamentally believe that as a customer for many, many, many yeah. years. But two, I could take my dogs there. So my two criteria is, can I take my dog and can I have, have a great cup yeah. and have a great cup of coffee? Yeah. And that's how I got to know the business. So I was I was a regular customer, and I guess you could say I was getting high off my own supply, <laughs> and I wanted to guarantee my own supply, so I um, I bought the business in 2018. So, okay. So wait, um, you sold uh, Naked Pizza, but then this co coffee coffee shop you used to frequent every day with your dogs. Uh, how did that aha moment land for you? There was a couple of different things. One is I'd gotten to know the previous owners, um, mm. and they'd become friends of mine. Um, and I was there regularly. We would, be, we would chat a lot about coffee, amongst other things. But I think there was a couple of different things that brought it all together. One is, as I was thinking about what I wanted to do next, and it's interesting, post-Naked Pizza, I'm like, I don't want to be in hospitality. I don't want to be in the food business, because that comes with its own challenges. The hours can be unsociable. Yeah. Um, but... I was sitting in New York at a cafe that, that I will not name, okay. uh, but I was drinking a great cup of coffee and there was a bag of Kenyan coffee available for sale that cost more than $20 at the time for a small bag. Okay. It, was, it was eight ounces, so I think about 227 grams. Um, and that coffee was really expensive. The good thing is in Kenya, coffee prices are public, they're available. 
So I had a friend of mine look into what that coffee, because it was fully traceable, you could see where it came from, and find out what, what, that, what the farmer got paid for that. Yeah. And the farmer earned less than 9% of, that, of the value of that product. And like many commodities in all over the world, not just in Kenya, we send things out as a commodity and the value addition typically happens in the global north or close to the customer. Yeah. And I wanted to change the narrative. I didn't want to be in a business where we were importing lots of things into Kenya, where the fundamental product is actually, we're taking the best of Kenya to the world. Mm. So that was the vision. Hmm. So, and just like that. So I'm seeing, I, I don't know if you're seeing lots of, um, I like to call them uh, purpose goalposts. So this coffee place you visit, you know, just next to your home. And then in New York, you see this bag of coffee. So you see all of these dots connecting. Yeah. Hmm. So it's interesting you use that term because what's, people ask me, what's your superpower? Yeah. And mine is probably connecting the dots. Uh, and I'm kind of seeing this when I'm in New York. I'm here frequenting my, regu my, my, my favorite coffee shop in Nairobi. Yeah. And then there was an opportunity to purchase the business. Yeah. Um, having explored a lot for about 20 months yeah. and not really figured out anything that I really, really wanted to do, literally had a conversation with the previous owners, did some due diligence and bought the business all in a period of eight weeks. So we had a conversation the first week of January in 2018 and March 1st I took over. Because then again, you had obviously been a business owner for Naked Pizza. So were you expecting more or less same challenges because it's a food business or not? A few weeks after buying the business, actually really interesting thing happened. I was introduced to a gentleman who's, who's now a member of our board. but. Um, He's like, oh, are you coming to Seattle? Uh, my friend Stephen. And, and I'm like, what's in Seattle? Mm -hmm. And he said, you just bought the best coffee shop in Kenya. And you don't know what's going on in Seattle. He said, it's a specialty coffee association show. And he goes, then you need to come. Oh, wow. And I said, well, let me go home and have a conversation. And he said, no, 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 no. Book your ticket. Come with me. So I went out on a limb. I booked my ticket. We went out to Seattle. Literally, I bought the business the 1st of March. And the third week of April, I'm in Seattle at the Specialty Coffee Association show, trying to learn as much as I can about coffee. Yeah. Was that enlightening for you? Um, Mind-blowing. I mean, I literally, my, my, my mind exploded in terms of what I thought the industry was about, what it entailed. I knew a few things before, you know, for example, what a high-quality coffee machine was. So we changed the machines very soon after I bought the business. We changed the grinders. There were things that were very particular about. We sourced very specific cups. So that, you know, we have six different cup sizes because every coffee should be served in a different cup size to really get the most from a flavor and a taste and an aroma perspective. So there are certain things that I knew, but I learned so much and I still continue to learn. I mean, every day yeah. is, is a learning journey for me. Yeah. For a very long time, we didn't even have a marketing team or a sales mm. team. Um, and we truly believe that the product speaks for itself. Mm. And we really focused on the product and the product being fantastic. And we say if the product's great, probably not too dissimilar to your friend. They know what they want. And if we can impress people with the product, yeah. they will keep coming back and they will tell their friends. So that was part of it. But, but, but a couple of things happened. So right. as we bought the business, mm -hmm. one of the things that we inherited was a lease for our second location at Village Market. Uh -huh. Now, early on, I did not want to be in the cafe's business. I'm like, I've done the cafe thing. Back to your earlier question. Like, I don't want to be in the cafe's business. You know, kind of direct hospitality is a challenge. Let's produce incredible coffee. Let's take it to the world. That was always the dream. Um, but then we opened at Village Market. We, we, we inherited a lease. Yeah. And at the time, Tribe, the Tribe Hotel was one of our biggest customers. They are our oldest customer. They are one of, are still one of our biggest customers and incredible partners of ours. Okay. Um, and so we signed this lease at Village Market and we said, you know what? We need to honor that lease. So we honored it. We opened. And we're like, you know what? Let's just see what happens and it exploded. People like we didn't realize, people that didn't live around Spring Valley or Loresh or that end of town, like we didn't realize that there's such incredible Kenyan coffee available in Kenya. Right. And yeah. we're like, hold on, maybe we're onto something. Hmm. Um, and then fast forward, we ended up opening a cafe at Westgate, then at Safari Link mm -hmm. in Wilson Airport. Mm -hmm. um, now in Karen, where with, we, we co-share space with Sandstorm at the Opportunity Factory, which they've created. Yeah. Um, we have this, this cafe here in Lavington, yeah. a small one outside our roastery, and one um, inside the U.S. Embassy residences. So for us, you know, we're now at eight cafes, but that's really been consumer and demand-led. Um, and then the flip side is we were never listed in any supermarkets before COVID. Um, because as a premium specialty coffee roastery, we wanted to make sure people got the freshest coffee yeah. as frequently as possible. And oftentimes, coffee sits on shelves for a long time. Yes. So we weren't in any supermarkets, with the exception of zucchini, we weren't in any supermarkets right. in Kenya pre-COVID. 
And when COVID hit, obviously our business had to change. Mm. All the hotels, restaurants, and cafes that we supply were shut, or they had to close. Right. So we're like, well, hold on. We still have to, we've kept all of our staff. We've got to pay them. We've got to pay rent. We've got to pay our farmers. During the COVID year? Yeah. Oh, wow. So we're like, so we're going to pay the bills. So we listed in, in the supermarkets. And so now we're available at every major leading supermarket in Kenya. Yeah. Um, so th I think that's perhaps how our brand seems bigger than it is. Yeah. Um, because we're in all the supermarkets, we have our own cafes. But, you know, we're lucky that over, you know, over 300 different hospitality partners around the world, most of them in Kenya, many in the region, you know, proudly serve our coffee. Well, my perspective has always been, why are the best things in the world always reserved to be outside of our home country um, or, or just for people coming in from the outside? Yeah. And this experience that we want to curate and create is a completely Kenyan experience. And like, yeah. for example, all of our cafes, we have a very, you know, as moving forward, we have a very similar look and feel in terms of materials and looks, mm. but our architect is a Kenyan architect. Yeah. At every, at every location, we showcase the artwork of a different Kenyan artist yeah. or a Kenyan-inspired artist, so an artist that may be living here. Yeah. Um, our furniture is made by Kenyan furniture. It's cheaper to import furniture from Turkey, from China, but we work with great Kenyan artisans and we'll have a different... Sh furniture partner showcased at every one of our cafes. So we want it to be a fully immersive Kenyan experience. So to answer your question, where do we want to go? Is we want to take Kenya to the world. Five and a half years ago, I thought it was through bags of coffee. Mm. But for us, what we aspire to is to create this and replicate this yeah. all over the world. Does that mean we're going to build a hundred stores? No. We love to have a Spring Valley cafe in London or in New York or in Tokyo. Absolutely. What's wrong with the hundred stores though? <laughs> Nothing wrong with it, um, but you know, our, our primary focus is on quality. And that's why we've not expanded to 50 or 100 stores. Yeah. We really want to be very thoughtful and considerate about the neighborhoods that we're in, understanding our, our, yeah. our customers. We don't want to run before we can walk. We yeah. also want to make sure we can deliver the levels of service and hospitality in our cafes that our guests and our customers have become used to. Yeah, it's amazing. This is your what number? Seven, eight? Eight. 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 Yeah. Oh, wow, well done. So Thanks. what goes into establishing a cafe like this one? So there's a lot of things. Um, one, one is just, you know, do we ha is there enough demand? Are there enough people that live, work in the area that, that want our product? Right. And what's great for us has been is we see where we do deliveries. We see where people order online. And where are those deliveries going? And we, know, we, not, we noticed that there was a gap in Lavington probably a couple of years ago, to be honest. Okay. But we struggled to find the right... We looked at a lot of locations. You, know, you, have, to kiss, you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find your prince. <laughs> and, um, and we looked at a lot of locations. And you know, people are like, oh, be in a big mall, be in a fancy building, we, all of which we've looked at. But for us, we think about our, our customer. We want it to be easy, convenient for them to come in and go out if they're leaving. We want it to be easy for them to come in and be inviting if they're going to sit for a bit longer. We don't want people to feel excluded because it's at a certain size and a certain type of building right. with certain types of security. Um, so there's the thinking of location mm. is primary. Is there demand around that? Mm. Um, and now, you know, we have a, a wider team that thinks about that. In the early days, it, it was me or me and perhaps a GM or head of cafes thinking through some of those things. But today we, ha we have a larger leadership team, a great team of baristas that really understands our, our business, we have a great team of people that work in supermarkets. They're like, we sell a lot of coffee in supermarkets in that area, so maybe that's an area we should look at. And oftentimes, there's areas that you know, we may not have considered that, that we look at. So right. there's the location, there's what's the space like, and then working very closely with, with, with our architectural team um, to design you know, the concept. And this is the larger format of our new concept. Mm -hmm. The smaller version is at Westgate. We had a shop there. We rebuilt it about a year and a half ago. Um, to come in line with these fields. Are the materials Kenyan as far as can be? Little things, mm. and, and attention to detail is so important. You know, I used to say just to me, but actually to, to everyone on our team. For example, our lights. Our lights are made out of recycled newspaper and hyacinth pulled out of Lake Victoria. But that's, but, but, so they look beautiful, but they weren't brought in just for that. Okay. They were brought in because they mean something. Um, you know, a lot of people say they strive to be sustainable. To, to us, it's, part, it's actually important as part of our design process. Yeah. As much as we can, the metal work that we, that we ask people to produce things to, we ask for it to be upcycled if it's possible because there's already a lot of things in landfill. There's a lot of things out there in the market. Um, a lot of the clay work you see, a lot of people import tiles. Our clay work is all from Kenya Clay Works. 
up on Thika Road. So we really have thought about those things. And that's an iterative process. And that takes time. It yeah. takes thoughtfulness. We have an incredible design team. Yeah. You know, we have a great team in-house that thinks through those teams. And then little things about what does the guest experience feel like? Yeah. What are the machines that we use? You know, we work with Lamar Zoko machines exclusively in our cafes. And we've done that since I bought the business. But it's a 95-year-old Italian company. Every single machine is handmade in Florence the same way that our coffee is hand roasted. We've gotten bigger and we could put an automatic roaster, but we haven't. We still hand roast every, every bag of coffee. Oh, wow. So everything down to the cups and the color of the cups, the grinders um, and showcasing those things. Even our menus are printed on recycled paper. Um, so for us, it's really, really important that we think through every element. Mm -hmm. You know, picking an artist, picking a great Kenyan artist yeah. that's inspired to paint or design something yeah. and is inspired by coffee. And that's an interesting story. We were yeah. introduced to her, we set up a meeting, we yeah. met each other, we're like, hold on, we know each other. Cause she's like, yeah, cause I sit in your cafe all the time and I've been inspired to do a lot of my work there. And I didn't know that, I didn't know her name, I knew her as a customer. And she goes, this is what I do. Oh wow. So she's, she was so happy and proud to, yeah. to, to, to put her work in. We were so blessed yeah. that it's not just an artist that we've paid, but somebody who, who actually cares about what we do, has spent time in our cafes for years before we even engaged her. Wow, so everything has been like um, synchronicities at play, right? Because Kenyan, 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 of course, maybe the Italian. So ensuring uh, sustainability with product and with the brand. But could you expand on, because that's where businesses are going now. It's a big conversation in the world now. So how have you ensured sustainability for your brand? So sustainability is a great catchphrase that everybody loves, yeah. and loves to use. And I, th I think some people do it incredibly well. Um, for us, it's about doing what we say and saying what we do. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite simple. Um, you know, about this time last year, I wrote a post on LinkedIn about how we actually got it completely wrong with our packaging. We tried to do things that were more sustainable. We tried to get something that was compostable. And we learned a lot of lessons along the way because for coffee bag packaging to be compostable, you need industrial composters, which are not available here. We weren't aware of that. So we've now changed our packaging now six times to actually work with a material that is probably more expensive than anything else in the market, but it's 100% you know, LDP4, which is fully recyclable and there's actually demand for it. So the people that work in some of you know, the garbage dumps or people that, that are collecting rubbish, they get paid if they collect LDP4 and it goes and it's recycled for other things. So that's one. Um, a lot of people use capsules. A lot of people have capsule machines. Mm. Um, very early on, one of our hotel customers said, oh, can you, can you get capsules for us for our machines? And I'm like, absolutely not. They're terrible for the environment. That foil creates so much garbage, we're not doing it. And they're like, but if you want our coffee business for our main restaurant, you have to do capsules for the rooms. And I'm like, hold that thought. And we went out and we scoured the market, not just here, all over the world, yeah. for, for compostable pods. And we went through three different iterations. We worked with suppliers from Italy and Austria and Germany to find the right compostable pods. But not just a pod that's compostable, but then how does that pod react well with our coffee? How does that pod work in a machine? Um, and that's, again, that's been a journey. So we refused to do pods until we could find the right solution. Right. Um, and that was, you know, th that was super important to us. Yeah. So what I'm gleaning from you is, unless it's perfect, if there's a level of excellence, then you're not touching it. It doesn't matter who says what. And you have to do your research until you're happy and satisfied that this is the way to go. I mean, we're very lucky that we're able to take a long-term view. You know, we're not thinking about the next quarter or the next year. We're taking a 20-year view. And that means that we can, you know, one of our core values is to do the right thing. Uh, and that's yeah. not doing the right thing for today. Yeah. That's doing the right thing for as far forward as we can see. Yeah. You know, so sustainability also isn't just about the environment, right? A lot, the environmental one is easy because you can measure it. You can be like, we recycle this much, we planted this many trees, which is great, but there's other parts, there's the, the social sustainability. Where we are in Spring Valley, you know, we outgrew our roast tree about a year and a bit ago, um, where we were. We were behind our original cafe and we were there for, you know, 13 and a half years. And we wanted to move, but we didn't want to move out of the neighborhood because a lot of other local businesses around there, you know, it's not that they survive because of us, yeah. but we're part of an ecosystem. Whether we buy, you know, whether we buy flowers from Christopher who's around the corner, or we buy meals from the lady at the kiosk across the street, or Josephine who sits next to the staircase, we buy bananas from her for the office. Whatever it is, is 
we're part of an ecosystem. So we've moved our roastery, but we've literally moved, you know, literally a kilometer down the road so we can remain a part of the ecosystem. Mm. And we've still maintained an office above our old roastery because we need that space, but also so we can remain a part of that ecosystem. So there's also social sustainability. Yeah. Um, there's also the human element, right? Like we talk about COVID, the easy thing to do during COVID is let's let go of people. Let's, you know, right now we just, and survival was important. And I think a lot of business owners did what they thought was right. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's absolutely perfect. We took a, we took a hard line. We said, we're not going to let anybody go. Yeah. We asked people to take a reduced salary for three months while we figured things out, but we were able to repay that by the end of the year. And for us, that was really, important. so in fact, we didn't lose people. We went from 30 to 33 people in 2020. We actually grew by 10%. Um, <laughs> And many of the people that we kept, many of the people that stayed with us during that time, today are, are, are middle management or leaders in our business. Wow. Because of that, because of that symbiotic relationship. Yes, yes. So the business invests in these people and in turn, they're loyal and they grow within the business. And but we're all just, it, it's, just about, it's just about a shared humanity, right? Humanity, yes. It's, 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 we're all people at the end of the day. Yeah. That's, that's the bottom line. Yeah. And people's circumstances, where they've come from, are different yeah um, and we all have a role to play yeah yeah I see that so how many staff do you have these people we're talking I about? would if you'd asked me yesterday I would have said 80 as of this morning <laughs> we have 81 um, um, so you know we uh, f when I bought the business we had seven staff we had three seven. we had three roasters three baristas and a cleaner um, what I'm proud to say is those three roasters that had been with the business since it started in 2009 so we always say we were established in 2009, but we were re-established in 2018 when I took over. One, yeah. um, those three roasters are still with us. They've been with the business since day one. Those three roasters, we've grown that team a little bit. Um, there's a lady called Sharon who's also joined that team. But our roasting team, Mohammed, Fred, Godwin, have literally been together since the formation of the business. That's amazing. Um, and we're, we're at 81 people today. 81? No. Yeah. And eight establishments? Eight cafes. Yeah. Eight cafes, yeah. Plus, plus our roastery, yeah. Huh, okay, so um, I think now I can have the, you know, I can take advantage of the fact that we are here to say we're taking a break, then they'll make me a fresh cup of, what am I having? You're having a flat white. And, and you? I'm having the same, this is my favorite coffee. So how is it also what you like? <laughs> I mean... I mean, if you're at Spring Valley Coffee, you have to, you have to, you have to drink what you have to drink with the CEO drink. Right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Got it. So, so, um, so we have to take a break. We come back. We get to know. Uh, how do you say aromas? What else did you say? Something. The taste. You. The, there's something. There's aromas. Uh -huh. There's flavors. That one. Yes. <laughs> so I will be seeking an education hopefully enlightenment by the end of that education on what uh, the flavors and the aromas are. Who knows? I may be having a nose for coffee, or let's just stick it to the water mm. after the break. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I like with this info? Like whoever roasted it, his name is here. Yeah. So is he one of your... He's people? one of our roasters. And it's funny, somebody once sent us a message on Instagram. They're like, is Mohammed a real guy? <laughs> and um, and you know, I literally took my phone, I walked in the roaster, I stood next to Mohammed, I took a selfie, I go, that's Mohammed. Why did you choose to, you know, celebrate them in this way? You know, it's interesting, you use the right word, which is celebrate. You know, oftentimes you come into a cafe and you get to meet like our wonderful baristas or the wonderful hosts that meet you. And we often see the people that serve us. And we want to celebrate everybody, everybody yeah. who's part of making your morning ritual yes. what it is. I think it's amazing. Amazing. Like if I had my name here, I would be marketing this myself. Like, yo, <laughs> I'm part of this. Buy it. <laughs> Welcome back. It's What's Your Story on KTN Home. I'm Catherine Mwangi. We're here at Spring Valley Coffee the latest cafe here in Lovington with the CEO and founder, Mr. Ritesh Doshi. Like I said before the break, I want to understand uh, what you say. The flavors that you have, obviously you work with the farmers, so I want to see what comes off the farms and understand that process. But of course, for me to pay attention, I need to be. Sure. Yeah? <laughs> so well, let's get you a cup of coffee first, okay, and then we can talk about it. Um, Kenya's best-selling coffee is actually a cappuccino. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. So could we, tempt, could we tempt you with a cappuccino? Will I be able to sleep after this? We can make you a decaf one. Oh yeah, there's a decaf we, cappuccino. We do. We actually have a Kenyan decaf coffee, which is made using a method called the Swiss water method, which involves no chemicals. Right. So, so who so, are the gentlemen? 
So we've got we've got Solomon here mm -hmm. and Mutsami, okay. um, that are two of our baristas here in Lavington. Okay. Um, Solomon, can we have a decaf cappuccino, please? A decaf cappuccino. That's correct. And what are you having? Flat white. Um, I'm going to have a flat white um, because that's my favorite coffee. Okay. And we were the first people to introduce a flat white into Kenya, made made with the correct proportions. Um, so flat white is a double shot of coffee, so it's very strong. Okay. Um, with a little bit of milk. So it's about 60, getting technical, it's about 60 ml, so two shots of coffee and 90 ml of milk. So it's a, it's a mm. two, you know, it's a 40-60 ratio coffee. So it's a strong coffee. Yeah. So you taste the coffee, but it's really creamy and smooth. So that's what you had oh, earlier. Yeah. So when you take coffee at this time, you'll still sleep soundly tonight? Absolutely. For um, real? Yeah. So, I, so I'm very fortunate that caffeine doesn't affect me. Oh. Um, but in fact, part of our quality control process every day, we actually what's called cupping in the coffee industry. We cup our coffees from previous day's production the next mm. day to assess it for quality. Um, and we do that every morning. So a lot of, it's like wine tasting. Mm. A lot of times you'll spit, but if it's a really, really great coffee, yeah. you don't want to waste it and you want to drink it. You don't it. waste it, right. Okay. Um, Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, I appreciate it. I notice you love color in your stores and the things, so, the cups as well. Well, what we want to do is we want to bring attention to particular things. Mm. So we have five different cups. So the espresso cup is typically, you know, it's intense and those flavors are intense and they're punchy. Um, we use a different, a different size cup for the Americano, which is, you know, a black coffee and which we frankly want to rename the Africano because our coffee is grown in Africa. Our coffee is roasted here. I like that. So why are we calling it Americano? Um, <laughs> so like we're now that. calling it a long black, okay. but, um, but that's great because it's a bright coffee. It's bright. It wakes you up in the morning. Right. And then the, the, the flat white cup is in this teal. Yeah. And it's a very specific color. It's RAL code 5018, which is really particular. But it's, it's the that's teal. That's the color code. That's the color code for this cup. And that's our color. Um, and, and, this, and the reason this cup is in this color is because this is my favorite coffee. Oh. Um, and is it your favorite color as well? Um, it has become one of my favorite colors. Then this is the cappuccino cup, which is in a slightly lighter color. Yeah. Um, and the cappuccino is the most served coffee in Kenya. Mm. Um, I would dare say between 70 80% of all coffees. Because a lot of Kenyans, the first time they experience coffee, they'll be like, hey, can I have a cappuccino? Yeah. And then we have a different cup for our lattes. So for mm. the large drinks, for your lattes, mm. for your mochas that have a bit of chocolate. Um, and we'd also use a cup like this for tea. Okay. So slightly larger, it, it kind of you know, evokes memories of friends where you're holding a big cup and, yeah. and sipping. Yeah. So those are the five different you know, cup sizes that we use. Okay. But, but the color is, because on a beautiful table, it looks nice. You, yeah. You've got a different color cup, yeah. I've got a different color cup. And it just brings yeah. life. You know, a lot of people will use muted colors, which is okay. But we, we want people, this is an experience. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I just really love it, including the machines making this. Yeah, so all of our grinders, so these are all grinders. So the coffee obviously is in bean format. Yeah. And it gets ground. Um, and we grind it fresh on order. So it's not pre-grind, we grind it fresh before the coffee is made. Okay. Um, so what we like to do in many of our shops is offer a variety of different coffees. So this coffee in particular, this is our espresso coffee, it's our dark roast. Okay. Um, it's the one that we've had, you know, we've had two for the longest time since we started. Mm -hmm. And that's typically what would go in any milk-based beverage. Okay. And then, and then you have here in the red grinder our decaf coffee which comes out of Nyeri and Kirinyaga, which is a Kenyan coffee, but decaffeinated using that Swiss water method we okay. talked about. And then this is an interesting coffee. This is what we call Mashariki. It comes out from Embu, from the eastern side of Mount Kenya. People like this coffee in the east. I was about to ask that. Yeah, and it's a beautiful coffee. Um, so, you know, we, when I bought the business mm -hmm. five and a half years ago, or almost six years ago, we had two varieties of coffee. Today we have eight. Um, and we want to showcase different coffees from different parts of Kenya yeah. and really highlight the work that our farmers and our producers do across the country. So Mashariki comes out, comes out from the east and we called it Mashariki because obviously it means east, east yes. and the sun rises in the east and that's why it's on a yellow grinder yellow. <laughs> and that's why the label is orange. Yes. So for us, everything has to connect back to something. And this is our little MT filter grinder because yeah. that's something if we're going to make you a manual brew in one of our kind of more sophisticated or one of our more interesting techniques, they can put any coffee in that grinder. So we keep it empty until somebody places an order. So Ritesh, I've always wondered the difference between dark roast and says fully washed. Does it mean there's some beans that ain't fully washed? Or what does that yeah, mean? Yeah, so, so, so first on the roasts. Okay, um, yeah, dark and medium. So dark roast is left in the roaster for a little bit longer. Okay. So it roasts for longer, it gets darker, and that often ends up what we consider the smell of coffee. So mm -hmm. the darker roast, the more it smells like coffee. But here's a little tip. 
a darker roast coffee actually has less caffeine because you've roasted out or burnt off more of the caffeine. So a light roast, something that doesn't smell as much like coffee, yeah. we think that's not as strong. Yeah. Actually, a dark roast has less caffeine than a light roast. What? Um, in terms of washing, there, yeah. are, there are different methods of coffee. Once they come off the farm, once the cherries are picked, yeah. one of two things happen at the washing station, what we call the coffee mill. Either they get washed and they go through multiple levels of washing to remove the outer skin, what we, what we call the cherry skin, the, mm, the fruit, yeah. until we get to the coffee um, bean. The bean, yes. But So there's a water method or there's a method that we call the naturals method, which is left out to dry on sunbeds, mm -hmm. sometimes for weeks at a time until it naturally dries and then the outer skin is removed after they've dried. So that's called the natural process. Okay, and that's the fully washed process. No, the fully washed is when it literally, as soon as it gets taken out, yeah. it just gets washed and washed until the skin comes off. Ah. And that's the wash, and then you can have a natural process that's just left out to dry for a long time. So is there any difference with the flavors? With Absolutely. Oh yeah? So a natural process coffee, it's interesting because inside the bean, you've got the fruit on top. Mm -hmm. It really takes in the flavors. Remember, it's drying in the sun. So it takes in the flavors of the fruit of the skin. And what happens is that coffee ends up feeling very earthy. Mm. If you like, like like a deep red wine, mm. it's a very deep, tanniny, earthy coffee. Um, it's a lot of hate thing. Some people are like, oh my God, this thing tastes and smells like the earth. Yeah. Some people absolutely love it. Yeah. So we were the first people to roast a naturals for consumption in Kenya because we, a lot of people weren't sure if the market would absorb it. It's still a, it's grown. But, um, but, but we're very fortunate that they, you know, people have been interested, they've been curious, and they've tried it. Yeah. And medium body? A medium bodied mm -hmm. coffee will, it's balanced. It feels balanced in your mouth. It's not too heavy, it's not too light. If it's very light, it just feels like water. If it's very heavy, mm. it could feel like something heavy in your mouth. It's just like a science, eh? The science and art, right? I mean, we get asked all the time what's yeah. the best way to have a coffee? Mm. The best way to have a coffee? is how you enjoy having it. Mm. And it doesn't matter. I'll drink my coffee black in the morning, my first two are black. I'll have one that's milky a bit later in the day. Right. So it really comes down to how you enjoy it. How you it. enjoy it. Are there health benefits to coffee? You know, there's always arguments, pro and con. People say the caffeine raises, elevates your heart rate and it's great for fat burning. Some people say, oh my God, too much is bad. Yeah. I, think, I think anything in moderation is, is yeah. good. Yeah. Um, the thing is, it's a, natural, it's a natural product that has nothing added or taken away. like whoever roasted it his name is here yeah so is he one of your he's one of our roasters yeah so literally all three of our roasters you know you'll, you'll see bags with fred's name on it you'll see bags with mohammed's name or godwin's name and it's funny somebody once sent us a message on instagram they're like is mohammed a real guy and <laughs> um and you know, i literally took my phone i walked in the roaster i stood next to mohammed i took a selfie i go that's mohammed because you know in today's world it's so easy to market stuff it's so easy to make stuff up but that is the reality of who we are. Why did you choose to, you know, celebrate them in this way? You know, it's interesting, you use the right word, which is celebrate. You know, oftentimes you come into a cafe and you get to meet like our wonderful baristas or the wonderful hosts that meet you. And we often see the people that serve us. But coffee has three touch points. Okay. It has the farmers or what we call the producers. And that's why we put the name of the cooperative on there. Yeah. Yes. So, that, so that's one part of it. Yeah. The second part of it is the roaster and, and the love with which they do that. We still hand roast every, every bag of coffee. And we want to celebrate the people that are doing that work that nobody gets to see. They're in the roastery. They're in Spring Valley. They're behind that roaster every oh, day. Wow. And then we want to celebrate, you know, you know, celebrate the baristas that extract it. Yes. So three touch points are growing, roasting, and extraction. And we want to celebrate everybody, everybody yeah. who's part of making your morning ritual yes. what it is. I think it's amazing. Like if I had my name here, <laughs> I'll be marketing this myself. <laughs> like, yo, <laughs> I'm part of this. Buy it. <laughs> so I think this is really, really amazing. Yeah. And of course, you know, the sweeteners, yes. This, what is this? These are the Nespresso compatible capsules that are 100% compostable. The, what's interesting about these is we've named these. We've named... Three of them are named after the three peaks of Mount Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, but my favorite one is actually Kitum, the wow. story. Mm -hmm. So Kitum is a cave in Mount Elgon, um, which a lot of people don't know about. It's called the Kitum Cave. And this coffee is, it comes from the Kenyan side of Mount Elgon mm -hmm. that we roast and put into that capsule. So that's why we've called that coffee Kitum. So how do you use the capsules though? So in, in a capsule machine like this, in an espresso compatible ca ca capsule machine, you literally get a capsule, yeah. you pop it in, do that, push your button, and you have a coffee. And that's also a great way to have a coffee. So there's, there's no wrong or right, right? Whether we're doing it in a machine or in a French press or out of a pod, 
or boiling it. I was about to ask, can I boil the, a capsule? You can't boil a capsule because okay. I don't think you're going to be, you don't want to be really <laughs> boiling the plastic. I don't know what that's going to do for you or the compostable material that that's around. So I wouldn't say boil, boil that. You're going to boil coffee. We're going to have got lots of bags of coffee to, to, to get you to boil. So I can only use it. In, in a capsule machine. machine. Well, yeah, in any compatible capsule machine. So not just this one, but there's a lot out there. This is one of them. Oh, and you yeah. just put it in there. So where do you put the water? So the water fills in this little capsule here at the oh, back. Oh, I see. So water fills in and... Uh-huh. Yeah, there we go. Okay, yeah, because I see this. And I see this too, and I'm like, I'm not buying something I don't know. So what is that? Well, I mean, besides being called a mocha bomb, it, it is actually the bomb. <laughs> and, and, and I have to make a pun in there. Okay. I, I want you to try one and I want you to tell us what it is. Like I eat, eat now, now? Yeah, put it in your mouth. I'll have one as well. It's chocolate. What's in the chocolate? Mm, a coffee bean. Yeah, so they're mm. chocolate covered coffee beans. So we do them in milk chocolate, white chocolate, and dark chocolate, depending on how sweet you like your chocolate or not. So it's a great little so pick me up. Coffee chocolate. It's coffee chocolate. So it's a good snack to have. It's a great snack if you have a sweet tooth, mm. as you do, mm -hmm. and, and if you like coffee. Mm. All of our coffee you see in our shops is always in beans. Yes. And a lot of places you go, the coffee's pre-ground. Like in supermarkets, we have it pre-ground. But in our, in our cafes, you come in, you'll ask for a particular coffee, and you'll say, I want it ground. Wow, so I see this was roasted by Godwin, Frederick, Mohammed. Yeah. That's amazing, their names are on here. So, colors. Brands. So what are these? Let's pea berry. What's what's pea berry? Is that so, a fruit? No. So pea berry is a particular shape of a coffee bean. So most coffee beans are oval, right? Yeah. When you look at a coffee bean, it's oval. A pea berry is almost a round bean, like a pea. <laughs> um, and for a long time, they mm -hmm. were seen as defects. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'd say about seven, ten years ago, people started saying, "Hold on, it's a lot more flavor packed into a smaller bean." Um, so people started seeing them. What, what used to be a defect, and farmers would get nothing for you're now getting a premium for. The challenge with that coffee is you have to know how to roast it because it's very easy to get wrong right. because the shape is different, the flavor profiles are different. Um, so we've taken a coffee, so all of, the, all of the beans in this bag are round instead of oval shaped. They're really? all round. Yeah. Um, Eldon. Eldon. So this is an interesting coffee. This, mm -hmm. comes from, this comes from the Endeavis estate on the Kenyan side of Mount Elgon. So traditionally, mm -hmm. you would get a lot of Elgon coffees from the Uganda side. Mm -hmm. uh, so this comes from the Kenyan side. But this is interesting. We were talking about different washed mm -hmm. and natural. This is a natural coffee. So this coffee doesn't, you know, doesn't go through that, what we call a wet milling process. Yeah, it stays in the sun. It stays in the sun. It's naturally sun dried. Some people call it sun dried. It's called Ooh. naturals and we just let it dry. Um, and again, for a long time, for many years, this was seen as only, only cheap coffees were left to dry naturally because water is expensive and good coffees were washed. Mm -hmm. But again, that narrative has changed in the last decade. Walking here and you look at this display and you know your I know you have a team of, you know, leaders, uh, you know, part of the 81 or your senior management, etc. So when you're looking at your books and maybe you walk in here and you just see customers coming and then you see this, eh? This too, you started here. Then you walk here and you stand here, including the plants. <laughs> sure they're not there. What, what, what do you feel? What does that feel like? Just seeing the growth. I feel very blessed. I feel that I feel very grateful yeah. um, that we have gr a great raw material to work with. We have people that you know, really tend to their coffee plants. They tend to their farms. We have wonderful roasters that have been doing this now for almost 15 years. Mm. We have a great team of you know, young and old baristas that, that really take care in every single cup that they extract. Yeah. I mean, for us, it's, we really say every customer, every order, every time. And that goes for every bag that we roast. That goes for every capsule that we pack. Um, and, you know, I, I think the one word that I feel a lot of is actually gratitude. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gratitude. I love that. So let's walk over here and lean on this. What do you call this before we go there? So we, we literally just, it's a queue rail and it's there to, to manage the queue and the flow. But what, what we like to do is it allows people to be close. You know, for us, it's interactive. So you come, you order your coffee, you follow your coffee through the grinding, through, through the extraction of the coffee, and it gets handed to you. But this is a nice place. So t traditionally in Italy, 
Italy, you actually mm -hmm. don't sit down and have your espresso in the morning. Oh. You stand at a particular height, which is 1.1 meters, and you stand here and you, have an, <laughs> and you have an espresso. Going forward, like where do you, so 2024, so the year is young, fresh. Yeah. If we stand here again in December, what will be the enlargement to this story? But what we really want to do this year, back to the original goal of when I bought the business almost six years ago, yeah. is take great Kenyan coffee to the world. So this is a really important year for us to take our product and take it to the world. And that's you know available online, so people can order it off their website anywhere in the world, get it delivered in three days. Yeah. Um, you know, potentially, we're looking at doing a couple of pop-ups around the world, so watch this space oh, wow. where you can come in, there's like a mini pop-up Spring Valley Coffee, you can have a coffee, you can buy a bag. So everything from your coffee being grown, roasted, but here's a catch, your baristas are also Kenyan. So everybody in that oh. value chain is actually Kenyan. Awesome. Um, so those are some of the things that work on. So if you fast forward 12 months from now, you know, probably another one or two cafes, you know, will be a little bit more out there in the international landscape and really taking the best of what Kenyan coffee has and taking it to the world. That's awesome. So for people, you know, who want to get into business, doesn't matter the level, because when you also bought Spring Valley Coffee in 2018, there was only two blends. Now that I know the word, two blends. And now you have how many blends? Eight. Eight blends. We have eight. So, so the blends are synonymous with the number of cafes you have. They go hand no, in not hand. Not necessarily, no? no. There's times where we've been up or down. We have eight okay. of them. In fact, we're releasing a ninth one, you know, what we call a limited release coffee. We'll only do a certain number of bags. Okay. We tried it for the first time last year. We weren't sure how the market would react to a super premium coffee. Um, but we did it last year. And we say super premium, it's interesting. That coffee has traditionally been sold abroad. It's never even been available in Kenya. Oh. And that particular coffee was always sold to a single roaster in New Zealand. And we managed to, you know, to work with the producer and get some here in Kenya. And we've done that again this year. So we, again, the best stuff isn't reserved for out there. We should also be enjoying it and experiencing it as Kenyans. So we're doing this. So we'll have a ninth one on the shelf in a couple of weeks. But again, just for a very short time. Yeah. Because um, it's a small Limited. batch. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really just about listening to your customers. Yeah. And I think for me, it's about focus. Doing one thing, doing it well. For example, we do coffee. Yes, we have a few pastries. We, we bake them fresh every day, mm. but we don't make them. We work with great bakers, great artisans. We really want to remain focused on what we're good at, which is coffee. Yeah. Do you ever go to the coffee farms? We do. In fact, yeah. not just me, everyone in our organization. It's actually part of everyone's annual training. And everybody in our organization, again, literally from our cook, at our head office all the way through to me, we'll go to the coffee farms at least once. I go a lot more okay. myself, and there's a team of us that select our coffees. We go out a lot more, but everyone on our team will go out to a coffee farm at least once, if not more times a year, to understand that process. So it's not just a barista who's here making a coffee. Mm -hmm. They understand the work and the care that went into yeah. that coffee being harvested, processed, and milled before it comes Yeah, through. so that makes it just not just a job, but it's, all, it's a vocation, it's a calling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, people have to be passionate about coffee. Yeah. And if they're not, then that's okay, but this isn't the place for them. Yeah, oh, I like that. Yeah. So, the things that used to keep you awake at night in 2018, are they the same things keeping you awake at night now? Very good question. One is obviously our exchange rate, and people ask mm -hmm. why does that matter? People ask why is Kenyan coffee expensive? So even for us, as a domestic buyer, yeah. we have to buy coffee in US dollars at the auction. So in an environment where our, our exchange rate, or where the Kenya shilling is devalued, yeah. our coffee costs 50% yeah. more in shilling terms than it did a year ago. Now we don't want to, you know, we don't want to be raising prices to consumers, right. but we don't have much of a choice given what's happened. Right. That's one. Um, you know, rising costs in general, the cost of everything has gone up, and we, 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 we don't want to compromise on quality, so we don't. But that means operating under you know, tighter operating margins. So, that, so that's a challenge. Mm. Um, you know, one of the things that, that really keeps me, keeps me awake at night is how do we continue to scale and be sustainable at the same time? Because we want to scale sustainability. And, and the only way to be sustainable is to be profitable. Right. If you're profitable, then you can keep buying from your farmers, you can keep buying from your suppliers, you can keep employing people, you can keep growing people. But the only, you can't do that if you're not actually generating a profit. Yeah. Your final words as you look into that camera, to whomever you so choose, I would actually want for you to speak to up and coming entrepreneurs, many of whom are shutting down because of what you just explained and others have decided whatever happens, I am sticking it in because somehow, some way, we, we are, we're going to make it. And just listening to your story and just how you've also just managed to grow a fully Kenyan brand, including what, what you said this were. 
So, so it's interesting. The, the lights that you see on the ceiling yeah. are in, in an inverted coffee dripper. And we work with a great ceramicist, you know, a company called Ceramica. And they were inspired by coffee drippers. We just flipped them over and they made them out of clay. So all the lights you see in here that are not made out of recycled yeah. paper are all, you know, are inverted coffee drippers. So just those little design aesthetics connecting back to who we are as a brand, what we do, do are important. Yeah. It's about resilience. It's easy to be knocked down once, it's easy to be knocked down twice. And often, you know, we give up at the first sign of struggle. And what I'd say is stick it out if you can. And also sometimes if it doesn't work out or if you fail, that's also okay. There may be a different time to get up and go again. Yeah. But give it your all, at least you know you've taken it. But the only regret that I feel that people would have is the regret of the chances not taken, not the ones you've taken and failed. I like that. I like that a lot. And if they want to reach out to you for anything, you know, there are people who say, wow, I like, I like what he's about. I love the values I've, I've heard him speak about. I may want him to maybe hold my hand or maybe someone I can ask a question to, business related, of course, you know how we do. For a long time, I've mentored people outside of our business. I've taken a view this year to actually spend my time mentoring, you know, the 80 people in our business. But if people do reach out to us using our Instagram account or on LinkedIn, you know, happy to point people in the right direction, happy to share experiences. But my focus this year is actually working on the people within our ecosystem so that we can continue developing them into being great leaders and in the future, great entrepreneurs. Thank you so much. This thank was you. very inspiring for me, like fully Kenyan, fully Kenyan. Well, thank and you. just the story, just your story of how even during COVID, you just somehow held your team together. And as of today, you are 81. So who knows, by the time we air this, maybe we'll be 85. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. And thank you for telling our story. And we hope, you know, we hope more people in Kenya and around the world get to experience our coffee yeah. and the incredible work of our farmers, our roasters, and our baristas. Yeah, I look forward to you know, um, seeing Spring Valley Coffee at the Dubai airport. Hopefully one day, inshallah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the airport I need you guys to be in, man. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much, Ritesh. Yeah, thank really you very appreciate much. Thank it. you for having us. And to you watching, I am so grateful you made the time today to tune into What's Your Story again story of a fully Kenyan business and businessman. Um, look, he said you can reach out to him on LinkedIn or Instagram. Actually, that's how I found him on LinkedIn. So yeah, he wasn't lying. And you know, if you don't die alone with those questions, those challenges you may be going through, he's been through that since he took over this business in 2018. And remember what he said during part one of the show, he was still a business owner with Naked Pizza uh, long before 2018. That's I think 2012, he said. So reach out. So before you take that decision, if you're not sure, it's always good to speak to the people who've gone ahead of you just to, you know, just to think things through and balance things through. Also, by the way, thank you, because you said, uh, when, before we started the show, you said, it's the first time you're closing a store before it's, what did you say, before it's close time? Before closing hours, yeah. So, so you know, since taking over in 2018, we've never closed the store. We've never closed, um, we've actually never shut a shop. Um, we stayed open every day through COVID, with the exception of our location at, at Wilson Airport. Yeah. We stayed, every shop stayed open yeah. in line with obviously government curfews and other things. And today we closed this store a little bit early. Um, but, you know, thank you for the opportunity. But for us, it's really important, you know, every single one of our customers comes up. We're only here because of our customers. Yeah. So it's important that we don't disappoint them. Yeah. And as we've been doing this story, by the way, there's just customers over here wondering, can we just get our coffee already? So... <laughs> We will just be saying goodbye, so we allow them in, and the show goes up on YouTube right after this, and a repeat of the same, Sunday, 2 p.m. So if you didn't catch here, you can catch on YouTube or on Sunday afternoon. Until next week, if you are a Kenyan business owner, by the way, you said you'll hook me up to someone there, the tea, the tea person. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So business owners this year, we want to share your stories. So I may not have time to be on LinkedIn and finding you and stalking you, that's the word I used on Ritesh, but uh, reach out to us. Our socials are on the screen. Have yourselves a wonderful evening.